Need more energy throughout the day? Looking for a kick to your workout? RockinThatIDLife.com has you covered with delicious flavors you've grown to love in tropical fruit and mixed berry, but now fall in love with the new fruit punch and orange flavors. Try them all at RockinThatIDLife.com. Realtor Mike Burgoyne with Real Brokerage LLC makes the moving process easier. Work with a realtor who plays and studies the game and will work as hard as the boys on the ice to get you the best deal. Check out Mike on the web at strikewithmike.com and jumpstart your move today. That's strikewithmike.com. This is Let's Go Blues Radio starring Jeff Ponder and two other guys. What is the worst goal you feel like you have ever given up in your career? Oh, I got to pick just one. There's so uh, <laughs> just one. How about, okay, let me, let me. Uh... Cheap, lying, no good, rotten, four flushing, low life, snake licking, dirt eating, inbred, <laughs> overstuffed, ignorant, blood sucking, dog kissing. Brainless, dickless. Amazing how in the morning I'd wake up and I couldn't find my toothbrush, and then I realized it was floating in the back of the toilet. And then I put one and one together, and I knew who did it. <laughs> I was Gilmore. When a guy misses a slap shot, the first thing he does is look at his stick. Yeah, we do. It really has nothing to do with the stick. Now the girls won't do that. The girls will internalize. They'll blame themselves when there's a mistake. Well, guys. Have- Yoke and it came down from, from uh, I believe it was the LA Kings we were affiliated with at the time. And the guy just had just a, just a rotten attitude. Never thought highly of him, uh, you know, from that standpoint. So, yeah. Summertime. Welcome to episode 17 of season 12. This is episode number 426, all time of the often imitated, never duplicated. This job would be great if it wasn't for the fucking customers. We're the original St. Louis Blues Hockey Podcast, Let's Go Blues Radio. Special thanks to our sponsors, RockinThatIDLife.com, StrikeWithMike.com, and CenterIceBrewery.com for proudly sponsoring the show. Please check them out. Also, don't forget to check out our t-shirt shop at Let'sGoBlues.com for some well-designed and fairly priced blues-themed t-shirts. It's Tuesday, August 29th. We're streaming live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Friendster. Okay, I threw that last one in. That's not true. Uh, to interact with the show on social media, our, our handle on all social channels is LGB Radio. Just search for us and you'll find us. If you haven't already done so, please like, follow, subscribe, ring the bell, buy a t-shirt from our shop, get on the Prudential Center Jumbotron while holding a sign that says, listen to Let's Go Blues Radio, or do whatever you can do to help us out. I'm your host, Jeff Ponder, and I'm joined by a special guest for tonight's show. We'll get with him in a minute. Kurt Price, Bill Day, and producer Austin are all sitting out tonight while we review the allegations against them. Uh, Dan, I hope you realize we're not taking any of this seriously. Uh, <laughs> the agenda for tonight includes rewatching the great. Oh, oh my goodness, I need to change that. The agenda for tonight uh, includes talking about the new PWHL and uh, discussing with Dan, who covered the PHF how things went down, and and basically what it was like covering women's hockey. Uh, All that and more on this tastier than SPK episode of Let's Go Blues Radio. Dan, uh, I want to introduce you, but before we do that, you are clearly a New Jersey guy. I threw in a ton of New Jersey references there, and I hope you picked up on at least a couple of them. I don't know. I'm actually not from New Jersey. I'm from New York City. I've lived here in Jersey for the last... Going on, I just started like my ninth year here. Um, I love the Friendster reference though. I did have Friendster back in the day. I'm guilty. Um, Friendster was actually pretty cool. I met a lot of cool people on there. Um, I I actually, that was, I I mean, I I was old enough, but I didn't get on social media until MySpace. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, I I met a lot of cool people through Friendster and we'll kind of leave it there. Um, You mentioned this is episode 426. Yes. That's freaking awesome, man. Like, congratulations. That's a <laughs> Thank really you. hard number. Um, I'm a little disappointed I wasn't on for episode 420, but we'll let that slide for tonight. We have more important things to talk about. We we actually had a special guest that uh, got sick on episode 420 and then came on on 421. And she <laughs> even said, she was like, I missed episode 420? And I was like, yes, you did. Uh, She's like, oh. <laughs> uh, no, the... 
The New Jersey references, first of all, it was a uh, clerk's reference. This job would be great if it wasn't for the fucking customers. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mentioned the Prudential Center Jumbotron. And uh, I was hoping you would know what SPK is. Are you aware of what that is? Uh, no. Apparently, if you're in a sandwich shop in New Jersey, I had to look this up. If you oh, ask for okay, SPK, yeah. that means salt, pepper, and ketchup. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I, I grew up in New York City. We would get bacon, egg, and cheese, salt, pepper, ketchup. Uh, okay. Kind of all the different jobs that I've had, as I've talked about earlier tonight on my show, um, I've always kind of balanced jobs while I was writing. I always had another job, whether it was a moving company or spraying for bugs or working at a bakery. Currently, I work at a nut house. Um, but a nut house. A nut house, yeah. So uh, we actually, um, when I would, some of those other jobs, I would stop and get breakfast on the way to work. It was always bacon, egg, and cheese, salt, pepper, ketchup. But I would never say SPK. I'm not one of them people that has to abbreviate everything, like, a lot of the the new generation is like I can't keep up with that stuff. I'm I'm still trying to figure out what some of these acronyms stand for, um, especially in the women's hockey world. It's it's sometimes it's a little confusing. But I'm I'm a you know I ask questions and and uh, I don't I don't assume anything. There you go. I like well that's a good reporter. Don't assume anything. You have Never to ask assume. all the questions. Uh, so we've got a couple comments rolling in here. First of all, Matt Harris says, "Welcome to the show, Dan." So Dan, this is. I can't even count at this point. Uh, five, five, six times you've been on this show. I mean, you're you're one of the first people yeah. that I remember like knowing through because we both used to work at thehockeywriters.com. And I remember being like, the Blues are going to play the Devils. And I'm like, not a big rivalry. I, what do I do with this upcoming show? And I'm like, I'll just ask Dan Rice to come on. And you, I think, I want to say 2011, 2012, somewhere in there, you were one of our first actual guests, which is incredible. So, you know, you you have a, a place in Let's Go Blues Radio lore as well. And uh, one of my, my most memorable appearances when we broke down the uh, – you had me on, I want to say, two, three years ago, two summers ago. Yeah. And you broke down the, the Scott Stevens trade tree, uh, yep. how that ended up leading to the Blues winning the Cup. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> um, when I went back to the arena in the in the, the fall that year, I was like talking to all my reporter buddies, Mike Morial, who's been on your show, and a couple yes. of my buddy Leo, and a couple of the guys. Yeah, let me tell you about this this trade tree. You ever peel back all the layers? Da, da, da. I thought that was one of the coolest things ever. And uh, uh, you've been a great friend since the hockey writer days. And um, something I was just kind of talking about earlier, like the PHF doesn't exist anymore. And somebody asked me. You know, like, what's what's the big takeaway for you? Like, is it a memorable moment for you or um, something you were for, felt fortunate to be at or to, to cover? Um, and really, my answer is it's 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 the people that I've gotten to know. Uh, we spent about, I don't know, 20 minutes before we started recording talking about our mutual friend, Amanda Levier, who's jersey you're wearing. Um, <clears throat> knowing her, knowing my co-host, Allie Morris, um, knowing my friend here in New Jersey, Rebecca Morris, no relation, although they did play at the same college. Um, Interesting. They, they used to play it off like they were cousins. Um, <laughs> our, our guest tonight, Ali Dunstrom, on, on my show on Twitter. Um, I, I could go on and on about the different players that I have different different relationships with. Um, and it's not just based on hockey. It's, it's like life stuff. Like um, Ali Dunstrom went through a serious heart procedure um, right, right around when COVID was full swing in the United States and, and around the world, and everything was kind of shut down. There was no hockey being played, um, and I remember talking to her on a daily basis about what she was going through as she was also recovering from a knee injury, um, and then going to play in the bubble in Lake Placid that failed miserably for the NWHL. But um, I was also going through something helping my mom out. I was down in Florida for a couple of weeks, and and Allie was always calling me or texting me, and we were checking up on each other and. Um, same kind of thing with Lev, like, um, when the PHF announced or when the announcement was made that the PHF was, uh, dusted, like, like Thanos snapped his fingers and dusted the entire league. Um, and we lost, um, Lev was one of the, the few people that reached out to me to see, ask me, how am I doing as if I played in the league and, and, you know, but she knows the, the energy, the effort, the time that I invested in 
um, covering the league and giving the players like herself and, and her peers the the recognition that they should get. Um, it's always been an uphill battle, but they, her and, and like I said, numerous others were, were extremely, and their family members too, like Lev's parents, um, Allie Dunstrom's parents, uh, Jonna Alber's parents, or her dad specifically, um, you know, that, that, that meant the world to me. And that, that means like, again, like the league might be gone, but the stuff that we did and the relationships, the community, that, the community that we built, that's the part that's still going to, whether they go on and play in this new league or not, like that's, those people are always going to be my friends. Um, it's just a matter of you're not going to get to see them every time they come to town now because not every player is going to – that played in the PHF is going to play in, in this new league. Some of them are already signed and playing overseas. Like those those uh, leagues in Sweden and Switzerland, they started already. Like I had a player on uh, early in – two players on actually earlier in the summer who um, – one signed before the PHF ended and the other signed like a week after. Um, because that was wow. that was the best option, and you know, uh, didn't think they were going to be able to qualify for uh, only six team league in in North America. Yeah, I mean you you can't uh, you can't sit around and wait for sure. You know, I'm sure for a lot of these ladies, it was you know, well, you know, they're starting up this league. There's who knows how many teams they'll have. There's a good chance they'll at least get a tryout. But it's like this is their lives. Like they can't. I mean, we see it with NHL players. Even you know they. They, you know, be midsummer and it's like, I'm still not signed. I'm just going to go play overseas. Like you got to think about your livelihood. So I'm sure for a lot of these ladies, it was like, I'm not waiting around to figure out what's happened with this league. I got to move on and I got to, I got bills to pay. I got family to think about. So one of the players I had on recently, uh, Christina Shanahan, uh, played for the Montreal force last season, uh, straight out of college, uh, university of Vermont had a nice rookie season, you know, little, first taste of pro hockey um, had signed on already for a second year in the PHF quit her day job because she was making a little bit more money. She signed for more money this season was going to dedicate the extra time to, uh, you know, work harder, whether it's training on the ice, off the ice, um, watching video, all that kind of stuff. Like she was ready to, to really dedicate more time. And then the PHF ends right Oof. now. There's only going to be six teams. She doesn't think she could make one of those six teams. Considered playing overseas, but that's not for her at this point in her life. Um, can't get the job back that she quit because, like, she can get the job back, but, like, you know, business is business. They ain't going to hire you back at the same salary that you, they had you at. You're going to start back at the bottom. So, yep. you know, and there's there's so many players like that where whether they rented a condo or, or put a down payment on a car – Right. And thinking you're going to be making more money this season. Um, and then there's no team. There's no league. Uh, I talked to the Buttes goaltender, Lolo Bernson, uh, over in Sweden. Uh, we talked about it a little bit briefly off the air. Um, she woke up to the news that there was no league. She wasn't on the, the call that said, hey, um, the PHF no longer exists. Your assets are being bought. Uh, she's cool. She's in Sweden. So she wakes up to that news. She was signed to play in Buffalo. Like she was making travel plans to to fly in right around this time of, of you know, early September, late August to get into Buffalo, get settled. Um, and as a goaltender, there's even less spots than forwards and defense, right? Goaltender, there's only two oh, yeah. per team, um, especially overseas at this point in the, in the game or at that point in the game and uh, late, late June, early July. Everybody's team is filled up. They had a couple of spots for import players, but for a goaltender, like it, it's tough sledding. Um, you know, I, I, I really felt for her and a lot of players in that situation. I think she's going to be able to find a spot. Um, she said she had a couple of hopeful conversations. Um, but again, that's, you know, I, I don't know when I'm ever going to see Lolo play again in person, see her, you know, cross paths with her in person, interview her in person. Um, but I'm still going to keep that connection. And, and that's, you know, that takes effort sometimes. She's six hours ahead of me, right, in Sweden. Um, it, it can be mind-boggling, the, the time zone stuff. But, uh, you know, every couple of weeks I check in with her, see how she's doing, everything okay, um, any good news, that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, there's, there's a, I had a lot of tough conversations um, after that, like I said, 
Thanos snapped his finger and, and half of women's hockey just disappeared. And for a lot of us, uh, you know, speaking personally, like I felt like we lost, like there's that line. And yeah. in, in, I know you've seen Endgame where Star Lord says, what just happened? Did we just lose? Like, that's how I felt when, when all that news happened, because it's, it's great that there's going to be one league, even though there was already one league and all the best players are going to be in it. And that's awesome. Um, but all the people that, that worked hard for the last eight years, a lot of that has just really disappeared. Um, the team names aren't going to continue. Um, the, the stuff that we wrote about is kind of irrelevant now, like in, in, in some regards, not in all regards, right? There's, there's different stories and, and stuff that can always be retold, but um, it really feels like that everything we kind of fought for or lost because we lost because it feels like this league is catered to the Olympian, the Olympic players, the Olympic caliber players. And in a lot of ways, it feels like this is just a practice league for them in between Olympic cycles um, or world championships or whatever. And, and those are the best players, right? They should, they should have a home, a league to play in. Um, but at what cost? Like when I see, this happens and these seven teams disappear and then they announce six new teams and what, like four or five of them in the same spot. You're telling me the, you couldn't build around, you know, you didn't have to keep all seven teams. I get that. You don't want to keep a team in Buffalo or Connecticut, whatever. I, I can, I can somewhat understand that, but you have Montreal, Toronto, Minnesota, Boston, as your kind of hub cities. And you're saying, you know, the, the white caps who've been, a professional team longer than any professional league. They go way, way back. Uh, if your listeners don't know, there's, there's a, a lot of great stories about the old Minnesota Whitecaps who used to play against college teams and they would go play against uh, teams in Sweden. Um, right. They played in the old CWHL when it was the WWHL or something. Um, you know, that, that's a rich history. And now all of a sudden the Whitecaps just don't exist. Like, and that's something we talked about earlier tonight with Ali Thunstrom was, there's a junior Whitecaps program now out in Minnesota. So oh, that's great. even though there's no Minnesota Whitecaps and, and this, this new group wants to move away from the Boston Pride and the Minnesota Whitecaps and the Riveters and the Toronto Six, they don't like the names. Uh, you could have built around it, I think. And um, it's just kind of sad in that respect. And <clears throat> I'm still a little salty. I'm sure it comes across in, in – No, in my not at all. Just a little bit, but like – um, it's tough because, uh, like I said, a lot of my friends, you know, aren't going to be playing anymore. Or don't have jobs like the support staff, the coaches, uh, a lot of volunteer work goes into getting these games off the ground and um, going to as many games as I did. You, you become friendly with a lot of these people and you kind of look forward to seeing them, you know, every like like going back to school. Right. Like you, you go away for the summer and you look back to catching up on everything that happened during the summer. And now it's. I don't do, get to do those in person, I guess. Uh, we'll see. There's supposedly going to be a team nearby in New York that might not be playing in New York. So we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Nothing, And that's the thing. That's the other part that like the timing of it all. They did it when there were so many players signed for this upcoming PHF season. Um, it just feels really rushed. And now you have this announcement where they're like, yeah, we're playing in these locations, but we don't actually have rinks set up yet. We don't have a team name. We don't have GMs. You know, we kind of know which players are available um, and we'll have kind of like our base pool. But, um, you know, it's it's so late in the game. Players have to make decisions on other aspects of their lives. Like, um, and the salary is going to be lower than it was going to be for the majority of these players. So they're kind of back at square one where it's like and pretty much everybody that's going to play this year is not going to be playing on a living wage. Like not in any, of the, right. not in any of the cities they're going to be playing in anyway. Like Boston's expensive place to live. Toronto too. I'm sure like Montreal. I'm, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a Canadian expert on, on markets like that, but like, and I know around here in New York, like if, if they play in Connecticut, like that's, that's not cheap either. Like Connecticut is expensive place to live. So yep. we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm salty a little, I guess, but um, ultimately it's to be expected, but I'll say, Dan, I know that you got, you said that you and, and a lot of the players, it almost feels like what you've done in the past is irrelevant. This doesn't happen without the NWHL and the PHF and everyone involved, not just the players, but the GMs, the coaches, the trainers, 
the writers, the media, the broadcasters, like they saw there is an opportunity here for us to actually make money off of women's hockey, because let's face it, it's all about men's sports all over. And, and, you know, you look at the success of the, the, well, first of all, the, the hockey Olympics, but also uh, the FIFA world cup for women. I mean, it, the competition has gotten so much better the last 20, 25 years. And I know Brian Burke spoke to that today. So again, I really feel like they saw the NWHL and the PHF and they said, man, this is something, this is something we could do. And they're having success. Granted, it was slow moving, but it was success. And I think they saw that and that they, that's why they jumped on this at this time because there's, they see the talent pool and they see how people are captivated by women's hockey. And so I just want to say that I do think that again, all the players, all the coaches, all the media, you guys are a big reason why women's hockey is where it is today. Oh, I appreciate that. Sometimes it feels like that. And then other times, like I've read some of the statements that come out today and I'm like, like they're not even acknowledging what just happened. Like they're kind of like, Oh, this is the first ever, you know, pro league to pay women or something. It's like that, that part, that's the stuff that gets frustrating for me. And I could, you know, I could play devil's advocate all night and, and say like, I've always been, and I told a, a player this about two weeks ago, when I, I saw one in person uh, from this area. And I said, you know, I've always kind of been glass half full, like, or, or I don't know, half empty, half full. I don't know. I was always optimistic. Like, you know, it, this is, like you said, it's slow moving, but we were incrementally moving this along. It was getting a little bit more popular. It was People were paying a little bit more attention. But now I, I can look at it in the other regard and say, like, why is this the iteration of league that all of a sudden is going to succeed? Because they have a CBA because Billie Jean King is investing in it. Like as all of a sudden people are going to stop being sexist and pay attention or all of a sudden the game's going to be found on cable TV or they're going to be, you have to like search and, and buy 17 different streaming services to find it. These are all like really important questions that like, I feel like nobody's really asked or answered. Um, and the challenges that the league is going to have to face, like everybody knows Hillary Knight and Amanda Kessel, right? And and the top players in Canada, Sarah Nurse and uh, Natalie Spooner, Marie Philippe Poulin. Yeah, everybody knows them. Do they know them? And are they fans of them enough? Are enough people going to show up and pack the arenas at these rinks? From what I'm hearing, yep, they might not even like they might. The New York team might have multiple home rinks over the season, like. I don't know if that's a great strategy. Like Montreal Force went through that last year where they played, you know, they were an expansion team and they were coming into a league where they're, they're trying to gain a footing. And they said, we're going to play because they got a late start, kind of like this league is. They said, well, we're going to play all of our home games across the province of Quebec and kind of build our fan base that way. And it, conceptually, it's a great idea. You you expose more and more people. They did double headers with junior teams where they would play before or after these games. Like, they did a really good job of kind of marketing themselves. But talking to those players at the end of the year, they were like, we didn't have any home games. We were on the road literally every week. Every Thursday it was like, all right, make sure you got everything packed for the road trip because even if we're playing in Quebec, it's a three-hour jaunt away or, or a two-hour bus ride. Or we're going down across the border to, to play Boston or the Riveters or whoever. Like, It was always an adventure for them. And um, I feel like a lot of these players are going to – be going through the same thing in this league if 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 that's the case again nothing is settled and that's kind of unsettling to me is this launch date of january like why didn't they just let this season play out and then everybody kind of come together at the end of the season and and start you know start from fresh and you know i i've said it a couple of times on my own show like the people that were that sold the PHF, the the, the board of governors, the the people that funded it, um, even the commissioner, like they were all snakes. Like they they just they just wanted to get their money and and you know cash out kind of thing. Um, and the commissioner was, uh, in my mind, like a, the new, the most recent commissioner, Reagan Carey, was a Team USA hockey plant. Like she had worked with Team USA hockey for years, so she was never operating like oh the PHF is going to run for the next five to 10 years. Like her goal was to always kind of 
merge or maybe not merge, maybe kind of, you know, the way that things went down. Like I said, it could have, it could have gone the assimilation route. Um, instead they went like murder, death, kill. Like they just, they were just like, no, we don't care about your, the teams that you, the names, the, the locations, the players, none of that, all the records, all that shit. Like, we're just moving on. We're going to start from scratch again. And you're taking a big gamble in my mind. Again, my opinions. Uh, you're taking a big gamble that people are just going to show up in the middle of January when NHL playoff races are, are heating up. People are going to pay attention to your league in addition to, to the NHL. Um, I know they wanted to be like the NHL with the original six. As somebody who's been in, around the NHL for a long time, I don't know if I would necessarily – recommend partnering with the NHL. Like they have their own set of problems. Um, look at all the shit that's happened in Chicago. Right. And yeah, we all know, trust me, we complain about that on this every single so week. It's like, <laughs> do you, and, and I get like, and I've said this a lot of times too, is like, it always felt like the players on the opposite side of the PHF had their hands out looking for a handout from the NHL. They wanted them to mm-hmm. fund and promote them and everything. And, and I kind of liked the way that everything was being done in the PHF side, where it was like, hey, like kind of like grassroots shit. Like, you know, we're going to – I drove to so many games where, like, there was more people dressed in hockey uniforms than there was in the stands. Like, it, that's the sad reality of some of these games, especially the last couple of years. COVID kind of shit happened, and people are still kind of finding their way back out. Like, it, it was really tough, especially in Connecticut, a couple of games. Like, there was nobody there, and, like – I would feel bad if I didn't make the hour and a half, two hour drive to Connecticut because I knew nobody else is covering the game. If I don't go, there's nobody there to talk to the players after the game. Like Ugh. that's, that's the tough part. And it's like, I almost, you know, I, I said, uh, I don't remember when it was a couple of weeks ago. Like I passed on an opportunity to go see Toronto this year in Connecticut because Connecticut moved even further away. It was like a three hour drive now for me. Um, and I just said, you know what, like, I'm, it's a weekend. I'm tired. I want to sit on the couch. I want to watch football and, and, and flip back and forth between the PW, uh, PHF and, and football game. And now the season's over and, and now the league is over. And, you know, I missed an, I'm, I missed my kind of last opportunity to see Toronto and some of the people I know on that team. And, um, again, you know, you keep in touch with them and all that kind of stuff, but it's just, it's tough. I, I hope everything works out. I hope it's, the best league in the world and i hope everybody tunes in and and like i said i hope everybody stops being sexist and gives it a chance right like that's that's i that's agree the battle like oh people listen to women's hockey like oh what are they all like dykes and you hear that kind of stuff right i mean we all see just the comments that are online from from you know people just you know and i, and I get that people have you know they're right they can say whatever the hell they want just like i can um yep, yep. But I feel like again, I can I can go back and forth on it each, each way. But like, I don't know why this is the one that's going to succeed. I, I just don't, and and that's just I'm not trying to be negative. I, I do hope it succeeds, but I don't know why. Like, all of a sudden, this is the one that that's that's gonna that's gonna they're, take they're, off. Like, because like, the way they were talking today, that they are confident. It seems that this is the one. You, so we will like see. How long until this this guy? Uh, the, the main investor, the guy from the Dodgers. How long until he says, "Ah, I don't want to do this anymore"? Like I'm losing money, right? Like, yeah, it, it happens. Like I've seen so many, you know, two year agreements and deals. The Buffalo Buttes were partners with the Sabers for for like a year and a half, and then all of a sudden that just ended. Like whatever agreement yeah. they had doesn't matter. Like whatever contracts those players signed to play in this upcoming PHF season, they just got ripped up. They got voided. Like this that. You know, that stuff happens all the time. The Riveters had a partnership here with the Devils. Three-year partnership ends after two years. They just rip up the contract, right? Like, yep. that's that's how business works. Like, So, again, I'm hopeful this works out, but skeptical. And and I'm not going to – today, like, I have – again, I have a day job. Like, these 11 a.m. press conferences, for the people that really cover women's hockey day in and day out, like, most of us have day jobs. So – one of my yeah. colleagues were from the ice garden were able to be there today. So that was awesome, but that's not always the case, but those things are for ESPN and Sportsnet and um, you know, the, the, the big, the big stations that they hope is going to create more interest for them. But 
nine times out of ten it doesn't work. Like <laughs> I've seen it. You know, yeah. they'll they'll post about it and then go read the replies, go read the comments. Like it's oh yeah, it's bag. It's half and half. It's oh this is great and who cares whatever you know like. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, not a real sport is what I always see. Yeah, I'm just like, sport, yeah. shut the fuck up. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's a real sport. Why don't you get out there and see how well you do, asshole? Yeah, um, okay. It's crazy. So, again, I hope it works out, but I'm I'm skeptical yep. and, and I'm not going to get into the, at least at this point, like, I don't I don't know where my kind of role is um, as far as covering it. I'm still going to do my podcast or my, my Twitter show that becomes a podcast. I'll still write articles here and there on some players, but I don't know if I'm going to get into the day in day out, um, you know, day by day kind of thing, because um, I did that for the last eight years. And, and, you know, it's, again, I have these great relationships and great friendships, uh, lifelong friendships. um, But, you know, it feels like a lot of the work that I did is, is, was for naught. And um, it's a shame, but um, it is what it is. I'm going to disagree with you there, sir, but I'm going to make you hold that thought because we are going to, we are, as I like to say in the industry, we are hard up against a break. Oh, so we're going to take that break. Very, we're going to take it right now. We will come back with Dan Rice. We will talk about his work at the Ice Garden as well as some of the work he's done for Pucks and Pitchforks, uh, which is a devil's site. And we'll also talk, of course, a little bit more about this new league and, and more about uh, him covering the PHF. So, Don't go anywhere. You're listening to Jeff and Dan Rice on tonight's special episode of Let's Go Blues Radio. We'll return after these messages. Every beer league hockey night, I grab my hockey bag and sticks and throw them in the trunk of my car. And the very next thing I do, I mix up a boost of energy courtesy of RockinThatIDLife.com. It's formulated to break up its delivery in three ways, which helps me get through all three periods of hockey. Phase one provides a rapid onset of energy, concentration, alertness, and motivation. By period two, I'm receiving a dose of sustained energy, increased focus, metabolism, cognitive function, performance, and feeling of well-being, which I need with the way I play. In Phase 3, I'm getting fatigue protection without jitters and crash, an elevated mood and a reduction of fluid retention to help me make the big play when it counts. This same triphasic approach helps me when I drink it during work hours or simply just for a pick-me-up when I need it. Try one of the four energy flavors by visiting rockinthatidlife.com, but make sure to email Dustin at rockinthatidlife at gmail.com and tell him Let's Go Blues Radio sent you to receive an additional 10% off your order. That's rockinthatidlife.com. Center Ice Brewery is a beer lover's dream for hockey fans. Based in St. Louis, Missouri, owner Steve Albers has been brewing hockey-themed favorites for thirsty sports fans since 2017. From the Beauty IPA to the Old Arena Lager, a cold, frosty, hockey-themed beer is just what the doctor ordered for hockey fans in St. Louis. Make sure to check your local beer store for Center Ice Brewery beer today. LGB, let's go beer. During the magical 2019 playoff run, I was in the midst of buying my current home. Every time I spoke with my realtor, obviously, home buying was the discussion. But in the back of my mind, I couldn't stop thinking about what was destined to happen for our St. Louis hockey team. If only there were a realtor who could have walked me through the process, held my hand when needed, but was there to be a sounding board when I wanted to complain about a certain hand pass goal. Let realtor Mike Burgoyne with Real Brokerage be that for you. He'll have your needs top of mind as he skates you through the home buying or selling process, dangling you past any obstacles and assisting on all your home goals. Check out strikewithmike.com for more information or give him a call directly at 314-753-4060. That's Mike Burgoyne with Real Brokerage at strikewithmike.com and that number again is 314-753-4060. Don't forget to tell Mike that Let's Go Blues Radio sent you. And now, back to Let's Go Blues Radio, the longest running St. Louis Blues podcast with Price, Ponder, and Day. All right, we are back, and, uh, you know, there during, well, actually before break, there was a lot of talk about what these allegations are against Kurt Bill and producer Austin. Um, well, 
we don't we can't go into it, guys. Legally, our lawyers are telling us we're not allowed to talk about it. So, uh, guys, just stop asking. Um, it's an ongoing joke, Dan. We we used to say whenever somebody wasn't here, it was um, because they were on assignment. And one time, one of our listeners was like, "You should." He's like, "Oh, they're not here because of the allegations I saw on Twitter." <laughs> and we all laughed like idiots, and we're like, "Okay, that's that's the new thing." I like that. I like that. I, I did that when uh, I had a couple of episodes. I, I gave Allie, my co-host, a week off, and I said, uh, "Allie is out on assignment doing some scouting," and she was actually playing hockey in the Selly League out there in Minnesota. And I was like, you know, next time she comes back on the show, we're going to ask her all about how she played and how the team was. And um, typical goalie kind of downplayed her performance. But I, I found out from some of the other girls, she she held her own and did a great job. So, uh, of course she did. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so, Dan, I do want to talk to you about, well, actually, uh, well, we got a couple questions uh, that we'll get to in a little bit. Matt, I won't uh, I won't forget about your questions I see here but uh first I do want to talk Dan a little bit about your work uh so again you work for and the women's hockey coverage website theicegarden.com as well as some work you do for pucksandpitchforks.com you as you've mentioned a couple times you are a co-host of the around the rink podcast um so I want to talk to you a little bit first about your podcast again you you do it with uh, yeah juggling man it you do it all. Good Lord. Um, but, uh, yeah, you, you co-host with former Ice Caps goalie, Ali Morse. Um, so, first of all, is that going to continue uh, as you guys go forward? I know you said you had a show tonight. And uh, if people want to tune into uh, Around the Rink, uh, first of all, how can they do that? And second of all, uh, what can they expect this upcoming hockey season? Uh, yeah, so we record on Twitter, not like a set night, like it can be a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday. Uh, I think we've done pretty much like every day of the week. Um, so we, we try and do it like once every seven to 10 days. Um, a lot of it I've, I've done, especially over the summer is like, Hey, I want to have this player on as a guest. What's your availability? I always kind of defer to them and say, Hey, what's the best time you can do this at night on a weeknight? Um, like I said, one player was heading to go play overseas. So I wanted to have her on a couple weeks before that. So she can just kind of focus on that and, and get herself, uh, get her life together, basically. Um, right. Other, other players it's, it's, you know, they're on vacation. I come on before or after vacation or, or whatever. So, so yeah, we do it on Twitter or whatever everybody's calling now. I still call it Twitter. I haven't updated it yet on my phone. Um, me neither. <laughs> I'm, I'm against the X, but we'll call it the Twitterverse. Uh, we, we record live in the Twitter, live in the Twitterverse. Easy for me to say. Um, if you want to go back and listen, if anybody listening wants to go back and listen to any of those episodes, you just have to search for "Around the Rink" and put in my at uh, Doctor Ice Hockey, D R Ice Hockey, D Rice Hockey. However you look at it uh, on Twitter, um, you can find all of our. I think we've done twenty four or twenty five shows on there, um, dating back to when the PHF season was ending. Um, I did the first couple of shows by myself and then um, started getting kind of cotton mouth and um, not having t- a chance to breathe and, and uh, running out of breath. So I kind of brought Allie in the, as kind of like a test run one or two times. And uh, we obviously knew each other a little bit, but never really spoke that long. Uh, but she's super easy going. As you know, Lev is, they're, they're like two peas in a pod, the two of them. So um, when we actually had Lev on the show, it was like, I could sit there and listen to the two of them talk about goalies and hockey for like two hours. And I was just like, yep. I, I write out a script kind of like you did. Um, and I've kind of taken lessons from you too, and as well as from other podcasts I listen to, um, little, little markers and things that maybe I can take and, and kind of tweak and, and use for my own show. Um, so we kind of, we have a script and kind of loosely, you know, just so we stay on task. So I don't ramble off and, um, I'll always write Allie's kind of topics or questions in red ink. And so she knows when it's her time. And so we're all kind of on the same page. Um, and it's been really great. We've had a lot of fun with it. Um, again, I, I, we've had numerous goalies on and I love, I could love j- just listening to them talk about, uh, you know, who, who's hitting you the most headshots in practice and who's the toughest <laughs> stop on a breakaway and who's, you know, if you're on the bench, do you want to, do you want help opening the door? Or do you just want to handle it yourself? Like all those kind of fun, quirky kind of things. 
Um, and it's been a blast. It's, it's been really great that we've gotten the support um, from not only the ice garden, but our community to, to do something like this. Um, and then uh, for people that don't want to listen to it on Twitter or, you know, don't have Twitter or whatever we're calling it, um, you can search for the ice garden and any place where you listen to podcasts at Apple music, Spotify. Um, I'm sure there's some other places I don't know about, but those are the two main ones that I can, I actually see kind of like what the audience has been. Um, just search for the ice garden and you can find um, all of our episodes. I know are on uh, Spotify and Apple music. Um, not only our show, but uh, we have, a current show with Alyssa Turner, who does a show called turnovers with Alyssa. Um, and she's had on Carly Jackson and I uh, forget who the second guest was, but she does kind of like a monthly thing. And that's more kind of like what you guys do with there's there's a, a video and also an audio portion uh, right. or audio Avenue, I guess for people to listen to. Um, and yeah. And, and, you know, over at the ice garden, we, we kind of, um, if your listeners are familiar with everything that happened with SB Nation this past year, we were, hey, we were we were one of the ones who kind of got our funding cut and everything, and um, we started a GoFundMe. And I told our, you know, our leader Mike Murphy, I was like, oh, man, I don't know if we're gonna get like five hundred dollars donations, like, but you know, you do you. If you think we can do it, set up the GoFundMe. Um, we got like thirteen thousand dollars after like a month and a half or something like that. Yeah, it was incredible. I I definitely watched along with that. That was so cool to see. We were able to get like enough support to kind of keep us afloat for at least a year and then some. Um, and Mike is able to kind of pay us a little bit more fairly than we were being paid in the past. Um, and great. one of the cool things about that was me bringing Allie on to, you know, I wasn't just going to have her just hang out with me once a week and, and not compensate her for it at all. Like uh, we split everything 50-50. Uh, right down That's the middle. Great. Even if she can't make a show, we had a couple of shows. Like I said, she wasn't there. Like we, she still gets paid. Um, she's still a part of the ice garden now. And um, that's really awesome. And, and we, you know, we've had to go to a somewhat subscriber model where we don't have ads on our website anymore. It's awesome. It's like, you can, you don't have all these annoying pop-ups and things like that. Um, oh yeah. But we're able to have some, articles behind the paywall to keep some of the subscriptions in. And some people have subscribed um, for a month, for a full year. Um, and we really love and appreciate that. Just, you know, and it, this is the dead time of year, this end of summer, right? There's not a lot going on. We, we would be getting up, uh, you know, ready for the, for the upcoming season. And now it's kind of all delayed and pushed back. So um, it's been a little trying time as far as content, but there's obviously news happening now. And we got that, uh, we got a lot, a lot of cool stuff up on that on the website currently. My last article was on. Uh, we've talked a lot about the Minnesota Whitecaps tonight. Uh, John Albers plays for the Minnesota Whitecaps. Uh, pretty much dominated the NWHL since the Whitecaps came into it, with and without the Olympians in the league, because uh, she played on a team that had Kendall Coyne Schofield and outscored her, outscored Hannah Brandt. Um, Outscored this player, outscored that player, put up the fastest hundred point, excuse me, fastest to a hundred points. Did it in eighty five games. Only three players in league history did that. Um, and John mm -hmm. did it the fastest. And I said, you know, it's strange that she's never been selected to play on Team USA. It's really strange yeah. that she's never even gotten like an invite to a training camp. Um, that's that's where I kind of draw a line in the sand because I'm like, okay, I get not making the team. You think back to how 1980 team was sure. constructed, the men's team. You know, like, okay, this person just doesn't fit the style. I get that. But to not even get an invite, to get a look, right. come and, on. And, what are you doing, Team years, USA? Like, it's not just, a, oh, they didn't look at her recently. Like, this has been going on pretty much her whole career. She dominated high school, dominated college at, at uh, University of Maine. Um, is this Maine or New Hampshire? I always get those two confused because they have the same colors. Uh, I think it's New Hampshire. Regardless, she dominated there, never got a sniff. And then this past season, the everybody, women's hockey fans know there was a, a USA-Canada rivalry series. Um, and so USA took four four players, I think it was, from the Whitecaps, and one of them wasn't her. And that, to me, is just like – like, what are we even doing here? And no disrespect to those players. And, and I know a lot of times everybody says, 
you know, with all due respect, and, they, and, it, and an insult follows. No insult to those <laughs> right. players. But, like, Jonna has more points than all of them combined. Like, if you add up, like, their career totals, she has more points than all. And I know points isn't everything. Is it because she's too small? I mean, she's not as she's not smaller than Kendall Coyne Schofield. She's the smallest person in the world. Like, is it because she didn't go to the right school? Does she not keep the right circle of friends? So this is kind of what I wrote about. I went on a pretty explicit rant uh, on one of my shows before we had a guest on. And so I re- really let down for our guest <laughs> to have to follow that kind of uh, explosion. But I just got like really mad about it. And um, I kind of cleaned it up and, and wrote an article for the Ice Garden for it. So that's my latest there. I have uh, a couple other things in the works, but uh, it's been pretty quiet recently with, you know, the, the league ending and uh, just been doing the podcast mostly and, and uh, kind of being that kind of conduit for information. Well, so the ice garden, I imagine is going to continue covering women's hockey and I'm sure there's plenty of stuff up right now. It'll continue to pop up the next couple months um, as things roll along. Uh, Dan, I'm going to roll through some of the stuff we heard today in the uh, press conference. There was a lot out there. I'm telling you friends, if you go out on Twitter, uh, again, go to the Ice Garden. You can get all the updates, everything we heard today. Uh, but first of all, there was a couple leaks last night that obviously got spread into the actual announcement today, the press conference we had. So the six teams, as we've uh, uh, I've already talked about, there'll be a team in Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, New York, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Boston. Uh, they have not named names they have not they don't even have a league logo yet so they don't even have team logos team mascots none of that has been decided yet uh lot to do yeah i know time is <laughs> clock is ticking yeah i was thinking the same thing they're they're talking about all that in the in the announcement today and i'm sitting here like clock's ticking guys it's almost september like we need to get on this um we've also got uh the player draft is going to happen on september 18th free agent period begins on september 1st uh, the draft declaration deadline. So that basically players who play women's hockey, they need to alert the league. Hey, I am interested. I want to play. So they are allowed to uh, declare they're available for the draft on September 3rd. Uh, there is a free agent period that is going to start on September 1st, as I said, uh, and it's going to go through to September 10th. So how that's going to work is team. There is team teams are allowed to sign three players before the draft. So basically all six teams can have up to three players on the roster before the draft starts. Uh, there was also a 10 day. Well, that's the 10 day signing window. Um, and then uh, there's a 15 round draft that's going to follow. Uh, that's again on September 18th. Undrafted players can still sign as free agents or tryouts if they're not drafted afterward. Uh, and then training camps will begin the week of November 15th. Uh, I think they actually said today officially November 13th, which is a Monday uh, also in the press conference today, we found out the director of the PWHLPA, that is a mouthful, uh, will be uh, Brian Burke. So uh, someone we are all very familiar with. Uh, I do want to get your take on that. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, there is a CBA that's been drafted. Um, they have basically a list of about 300 players long uh, that they have created of a player pool. So basically that's what a lot of, the evaluations have gone into for a lot of these players. Uh, so they've got about 300 names that they're considering, but that doesn't mean that anybody who's not on that list couldn't have a chance to play in this league. So we'll see uh, what comes of that. Um, again, we got the 10 day period uh, current uh, for free agency. So current or graduating players from the NCAA or U sports are not eligible uh, for this initial free agent period. So they will be included in the draft. Um, and then, uh, ooh, God, there's so much to go over here, but, uh, uh, basically they've said as and Dan kind of alluded to a little bit earlier, there is going to be NHL involvement. Uh, Stan Kasten of the PWHL did confirm that the NHL is helping them. Uh, Gary Bettman has, uh, personally been involved. I know somebody, uh, had a Q and a with Bill Daly today, and he said that the NHL is very involved as well. Um, they're helping, uh, broker relationships with teams in the new areas, uh, training camps, they'll need to have 28 players at training camp, 15 drafted, plus three signings, plus 10 other invitees. Again, training camp begins on November 13th. Uh, Matt, one of your questions in the chat there was about how, do they have any semblance of a schedule, games being broadcasted? The answer is no. 
Uh, they said they could start as early as January 1st. They just know January. That's all they know. Uh, they haven't built any semblance of a schedule. Uh, they've already considered the necessary breaks in the season. So, you know, anything for uh, international play, they've already kind of looked at that, but they're still kind of figuring out how the schedule is going to work around that. Uh, after the inaugural year, games are going to run from usually uh, November to May. Um and uh, again, they do plan on letting all these players compete in international competitions. Uh, they did talk about team staffing. So again, we talked earlier about PHF. It wasn't just the players that were affected by this, right? It wasn't just the media. It was people who were actually employed by the team. So currently, uh, it sounds like there's really not a whole lot of staff involved right now uh, in all these teams. Uh, they're going to have 11 to 13 people, all as full-time employees on each team. The hockey operations office is being worked out within the league. Uh, so they'll, they'll also be adding a business and commercial side of the league to help support these teams. And another important note, no GM has been named yet. Uh, they do say that it's going to be coming soon that we're going to hear about these GMs. I've heard and the league is yes. And the, and the league is self run too. So there are no, there is not owners owning these teams. It, it kind of co- makes me think of the XFL. Uh, I just got to say, like, and that's one of the things that kind of caught my attention today. The anti, the group of players that didn't want to be a part of the PHF, one of their big concerns over the years or complaints was that they didn't like the fact that in the end of uh, PHF, whatever it was, it was like one ownership group owned three or four teams and another one owned two teams. Um, And in the early days, the league owned all the teams and they didn't like that. And that's exactly what's happening right now. And it's like, I saw that. And I'm like, did one of them like Scooby Doo? Like, huh? like, are we serious? Like, <laughs> like, what's going on? Um, but I don't want to. I can go on and on. The only thing I wanted to add to everything you said: um, a lot of players I mentioned uh, signed to play overseas. Um, some European players that played over here last season. Um, not the one that I spoke of, but others have already signed to play in Switzerland or Sweden. Uh, one particular with the Riveters, Minto Twoman, and uh, she had told me earlier in the week she has kind of like an exit clause in her deal with her team in Finland where if she does get selected um, or if she's a team approaches her to sign over in that league, she can leave, but she obviously wouldn't have to leave right now. She's, you know, in the middle of playing a season. Like they're actually just starting, I think, or, or their preseason is just ending, but some of those players will have those kind of clauses in their deals, at least overseas, where they can kind of leave. Um, and and that's that's good to have that flexibility. But, I, you know, with the late start and everything, and, and it just – there's not a lot of runway, and you lose a lot of players that, like, they can't sit around and wait, especially because you know you ain't going to be making either as much as you are or, or a living wage. So, like, it all that kind of narrows – it keeps, like, chopping away at the player pool and – um, we'll see. Plus, there's a good there's a good chance that you know, let's say it's a Buffalo Butte player. You know, first of all, Buffalo Butte, you know, you're already going to be moving anyway because you're not going to be playing in Buffalo. So you might as well, if you're interested in playing overseas. And we've had players come on this come on our show before and who played overseas. I think of like uh, Curtis Sanford, Lubos Portechko. Well, obviously, Lubos Portechko's from Slovakia, but they they've all talked about like how that experience was so great being able to actually go overseas and witness other parts of the world they've never been so i have to wonder if some of these after the phf ended obviously at first you're thinking this really sucks but it also probably provided an opportunity for some of those ladies to be like oh well hey i can go to switzerland i've never been there before that sounds cool yeah and and, you know the hockey world is a small world right it's kind of like kevin bacon six degrees of separation kind of everybody knows everybody and women's hockey, it's even smaller. And if you don't know, like a lot of these girls, one of the the ones I had on my show, Taylor house, she went and signed with moto hockey over in Sweden. She don't know nobody on the team, but she played with a couple of girls at Quinnipiac that played with a couple of girls on this team or, or grew up playing with that one. Right. So everybody kind of knows everybody in in some sort of way, shape or form. And, and you also, you make new friends and, and you, you, like you said it, a lot of them, go over, uh, go overseas. And it's like, yeah, I get to play hockey, but I also get to travel because if I'm in Switzerland, Austria is a train ride away or Amsterdam on an off weekend or Germany or 
you know, you could do all the sightseeing you want. And, and I've had players say like, especially when they're young and, and at that age, like go experience it as, as much as you can, like uh, enjoy it. You might not get the, the best pay. Um, the money is a little different comparable to over here. Um, as I don't know how that all translates, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a money expert either. Um, but you know, they, they've all said it's a great experience and, um, and, like I said, they, they all know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. So. Right. No, you're right. It's it's funny because even tonight you've mentioned two people and it's like, oh, I've had them on the show before. Mike Morial and Mike Murphy. Yep. <laughs> They've both been on here. So it's just funny because it's like I hear you say these names and I'm thinking, oh, there's a friend of the show. Oh, that's a friend of the show. <laughs> right. And, and <laughs> Yeah, it really is. You and myself, we didn't know each other, what, say – 10, 11 years ago, we didn't know, I didn't know you existed. Um, yeah. well, probably longer than that, When whenever I started working at the Hockey Writers and, and you were there, but like, we didn't know each other before that. And now like, um, you know, anything blues related happens, I usually reach out to you. You reach out to me about the Devils or about Lev or about the, the, the Women's League. Like, we don't keep in touch every day, but we keep in touch and, and you know, I'm, I'm proud and proud of you, everything you've done since then. Uh, like I said, I take little little tips and tricks and kind of implement them into my own kind of thing, and, and I take a little from everybody, and uh, uh, it's awesome. It's I, I go through a lot of you know sadness and anger the last month or two, um, and I often wonder like, do I want to do this anymore? Like, and, and you know, you start to think about the connections you made and the community and all that stuff, and I look forward to going back to to the Devils you know, training camp or whatever preseason games in a couple of weeks. And like I said, it's like kind of catching up after, after a long summer and you, you went back to school and it's like, Hey, what'd you do this summer? You know? And Hey, where'd you go? And um, how's your daughter? How's your mom? Like, you know, you, you, you see these people day after day, year after year. Um, you kind of get to know them. And um, I experienced that same thing in women's hockey, just to a little closer degree, I think. And um, like I said, Allie Dunstrom, one of my dearest, closest friends, like, uh, we've talked with each other through so many different different episodes in her life and my own. Um, same thing with Lev and her family. Uh, extremely thankful that I was able to find that community because I'll be the first to tell you if you would have asked me or if you would have told me in 2003 that you know I'd be one of the leading women's hockey reporters, uh, I'd have told you to go fuck yourself. Like you, you don't know what you're <laughs> talking about. Um, but it was to the point this past year, like I said, like. I had people feeding me information like, Hey, this player signing with this team before the league even knew about it kind of going down. And um, I had Paul Mara who, who coached the Boston pride and now just kind of took a job with the New York Rangers. Um, I had him reach out to me a couple of times and say, Hey, you got this wrong. Let me set the record straight and give me more information than I was really looking for. And like, Oh, like, Oh, I didn't know it was A, B, C, D, E, F, and G like, Holy shit. Like, right. That's cool. Um, and Colton Orr was another one where he was coach of the Connecticut whale, um, numerous times. First time he gave me his number. He said, if you ever need anything, just reach out to me. Like, um, the, the respect that the two of them showed me and a lot of other people too, but those are guys that like, you know, I kind of sort of covered the league when they were in the, in the NHL and, um, you know, hopefully Colton's not watching this. I wasn't, I wasn't that big of a fan of Colton Orr as a player, um, but God damn it, as like a as a man and a person, like I respect the shit out of him and um, the respect that he gave me and Paul Mara as well. Like, um, and the player, oh, I've, the player I've told that to uh, home, like I've told that to Cam Jansen's face. I've said, man, <laughs> I hated you as a player, but as a dude, you are the shit. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and like, and Paul, Paul is a great guy. Where he's kind of seen, done it all. Like he's. He's coached uh, – he was the assistant coach for the U.S. women's team when they won the gold medal uh, a couple of years ago, right? And so he's got that that experience. He's played in the NHL. He was he was clowned and posterized by Ovi, that, that, that crazy goal he scored in uh, in Arizona where he's, like, on his belly. Yep, that was – who was the goalie, Dan? Uh, was it Boucher? It was Curtis Joseph. Oh, shit. Well, yep. it was Paul Mara flopping around in front of Curtis Joseph. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and his players gave him, like, a hard time about that. And But um, really good dudes. And I'm like, again, those are the relationships. And um, I do feel proud about everything that we did the last couple of years. It's just 
it was a really, it still is a really tough pill to swallow. It's and, hard now, but I'm telling you, man, over the years, you are going to realize that you were a, a, a pioneer of sorts of covering women's hockey. And that's something no one can ever take away from you. And again, the players that built women's hockey by playing in all these different teams and the NWHL and the PHF, they'll feel that eventually too. I know it stings now, but man, you're all pioneers. It's amazing. And and I'll tell you, I, I had a, a listener the first time we had Lev on, uh, she messaged me and said, my daughter didn't even know there was professional women's hockey. Now we're not going to miss a Whitecaps game. And they became Whitecaps fans. I think she even bought a, a Lev jersey or maybe it was even a, a Morse jersey. I'm not sure. But I'm like, that's, you know what? You may be the only person that I reached with that show that, that actually changed and said, oh, I want to watch women's hockey. If I even had one person do that, I was ecstatic right and the I mean, fact that i had one person reach out tells me she probably wasn't the only one that that was part of like the last eight years of, i went through that a lot where i was like yeah oh uh, what do you do like uh, i cover the devils and i cover women's hockey women's hockey like professional i said yeah like half the battle was people don't know it exists and again being cynical playing devil's advocate i could say like why is that going to change now like you're you're basically going back to square one and starting that uphill fight all over again. They think they want to be the original six. They want to be like the NHL. And I like, I ain't covering no games if they're like the lady Islanders and the lady wild. Oh like, God, no. Like that would be the worst possible move. But the way that they love the NHL, like if the NHL said, Hey, this is what we want to do. I don't think they would fight it that much. And that's like, that's kind of cringe to me. Now I, I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just, speaking my mind but like those are the things where it's like i don't know if if, if that's the right path like we'll see i, I guess yep. i'm wrong hopefully love plays another million years uh hopefully all my friends get to play as long as they want um but we'll see what happens there's a lot to be sorted out over the next you know a couple of months and um i've kind of taken a little bit of a like i said a little bit of a back seat in the day-to-day kind of reporting on things just to kind of give myself a breather. And, um, you know, devil season is about to start. I want to, I want to kind of dedicate a little bit more time finally to that. Cause it, honestly, truthfully, my attention was split like 70, 30 away from the devils, but I was still able to kind of maintain a little bit, but I, I do know some of my coverage slack because I did dedicate so much time. If the riveters were home and the whale were home in the same weekend, I would go to, Riveted home game and then drive to Connecticut the next day and try and if I, I do both in one day, great. Like if not, if I could if I could do one one a day, I'll do that too. I would I missed numerous Devils games to like go cover the, like I said, go cover a game in Connecticut because if I wasn't there, nobody was there. Right. Devils yep. play I, Florida. What what do I'd I I'd follow you on social Florida, media? Right? I'd follow you on social media and I'd be like damn, he's doing a lot of driving today. <laughs> That's crazy. Like, the amount of miles. I, I drove to Rochester once to see the season two. I think it was. I saw the Riveters and Buttes play in Rochester. Like, it was like a five-hour drive for me and each way. And I did it in one. It was actually that day where, like, you get an extra hour of sleep. Oh, nice. Basically, I drove home through time traveling, and, and it only took four hours instead of five. But it's a five-hour trip. Um <laughs> You know, I drove to Pittsburgh for an all-star game. I drove to Boston for an all-star game. I, the last game I went to, I drove to Boston to see the Whitecaps eliminate the, the pride. And I didn't think that was going to happen. I thought Boston was going to kill them 7-1. to one. That was um, an incredible game. I, I watched I, that one too. Lev and, and John had an uh, amazing weekend, amazing game. And after the game, Paul Mara says, you know, he says what he has to say in his, you know, 35 second post game press conference. And then once I turn the recorder off, he says, Hey, I really appreciate you coming out and covering us all season. Um, you know, it means the world to us and, and everybody in that locker room. So just thank you. Like he appreciated the fact that I was there, you know, four hours away from my house. Like, yeah, uh, that those is little incredible. things meant a lot to me. And, and those are the, the kind of takeaways I have, I guess. Uh, all right, so let's get to a couple questions here. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, Dan. I know you've already been doing – you've been podcasting all night. Yeah. So. <laughs> I got about five to ten minutes in me, and then I'm uh, calling it quits. T- yeah, let's take a break. Uh, take take a break while I get to some of these questions. So, first of all, Ken Morris asks, uh, will they have a farm system 
or affiliate with a minor league? Uh, the answer is no. Um, but I actually wanted to ask you, Dan, how they did it in the PHF. They didn't have any of that. They had uh, kind of like practice squad where you would okay. kind of get paid, you know, a minimal amount to show up to practice every week. And, hey, if we need you on Sunday or Saturday, if somebody's hurt or sick or has a commitment they can't get away from, then we'll sign you to kind of like a PTO or a one-day contract. Um, supposedly, that's what they want to have with this new league. Um, I've always said, like, again, I feel like they want to partner with these NHL teams. They want to go into the NH- NHL buildings. I don't think that's the right move. I think you got to aim smaller, go for the AHL ranks. Um, I agree. I heard, I heard last night uh, or two nights ago and then again last night that the New York team in this new league is going to be playing in Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is not in New York. But it's the tri-state area. And then we find out that these teams might be playing multiple games in multiple locations throughout their region, right? So then it kind of makes sense that maybe they play some games uh, Long Island or Brooklyn where the Islanders are and some games in Bridgeport where the Islanders are. So maybe that, that's maybe where they're kind of partnering up. And, um, you know, Boston could very easily have a team in Providence, I guess. Like they have an AHL arena, the Providence Bruins. Um, Minnesota, I don't know what they would do. Maybe play a trio where the Whitecaps used to play, the, the Minnesota Wild Practice Rink. Um, Montreal and Toronto. Uh, Montreal was supposed to play in Laval, excuse me, the Laval Rocket Rink this upcoming season. Um, their former team president, Kevin Raphael, had told me um, they were actually having a rink dedicated to them, like refurbished and kind of dedicated to them for the upcoming season. So wow, I would assume that's where the Montreal team will play. Um, but we don't know any of that yet. And again, tick tock yeah. motherfucker, the clock is. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Agree. Uh, all right. Well, let's, uh, let's close on a question about the devils. Matt Harris asked, Dan, what are the odds that the other Hughes brother comes to New Jersey? So y'all can collect them all like they're Pokemon, uh, I guess. I would say, I would say the odds are pretty low. Um, Unless there's, there's a way that Quinn ends up, he like demands a trade or something. Like, I think he's locked in for a little while there now, like the next three, four years. Um, it would be awesome. Um, when when they drafted Luke, there's a, again, you're, I know you're an Avengers Endgame, uh, Avengers M- MCU fan. Oh, um, yeah. When, when they drafted Luke Hughes, who's Jack's little, and Jack and Quinn's littlest brother, um, they, they, the Devils posted a thing like, no other team has been able to hold two Hughes brothers, you know, let alone one holding two. Was, you know, and they had like uh, Tommy Fitz, our GM, Tommy Fitzgerald, holding up the jersey, kind of like uh, Thanos holding the glove kind of deal. and Or, or like, uh, excuse me, Ebony Moore handed him the, the stone uh, on his knee. So it was pretty cool. We've had a lot of fun with, you know, I got to say like Jack is – maybe he was burned a little bit by, by some of the local media and and he kind of clammed up throughout most of the season. But man, once his brother came around, like he was like a completely different guy with us in the media. And as somebody who's there day in, day out, not every game, but a majority of games, like there's a lot of games he didn't come out and speak when he could have. And, you know, Nico, he sure will come out and speak because he's the captain and a great guy. And, and, you know, a a perfect human, like um, he's everything you want your kind of captain to be. And, um, Jack can kind of fly under the radar and, and that's great. Uh, but once Luke showed up, it was like, Jack was like a different person. He was, he was a little bit more engaging and, and jokey. And I know he has that side to him, but, um, he had kind of clammed up and, and I think, you know, he had, you know, you know how hockey media has become where it's kind of like a instant reaction. You know, there's no, like, uh, the news cycle lasts five minutes and then there's another news cycle, right? And Oh, yeah. I, I think he had one bad game in the stretch of when they played, like, amazing hockey and, and some of his words get twisted out of context and then he doesn't really – he clams up the rest of the season, right? He doesn't speak too much. And um, when he does speak to us, you're getting a lot of, like, yeah, I thought we were great tonight. Yeah, you know, that's a great team over there. Yeah, it was yeah. an awesome win for us. You know, it's a great it's a great win for the boys. You're not really getting much out of him. and. Once Luke showed up, it was kind of like he became like a Lucy Goose kind of having fun. And, um, man, I wish I would have got to 100 points. And, you know, Luke's going to say it was all because of him, you know, that, that we, that we you know, clinched this uh, this amazing spot in the playoffs because he scored the, the game-winning goal and, 
in our, you know, record breaking season in his first game, like, you know, all these like uh, different scenarios popped up and it was really great to see. And um, as disappointed as I am with women's hockey, uh, I'm excited about the future of devil's hockey and Hughes and he's and bringing over a guy like Timo Meyer and locking him up and uh, Dougie Hamilton. Oh. You guys are on the opposite end of where the blues are right now. You guys are at a very exciting point. Um, I was was rooting for them last year, man. I, I was like, go devils. I'd want to see this team succeed. They're a lot of fun to watch. You mentioned you hadn't had me on in a while. I'm like, I'm kind of like rooting for our teams to make a trade. So you could at least like call a brother up and be like, Hey, you want to pop on for five minutes? But you know, I know you guys had a lot of draft picks. I'm like, we couldn't even pull off like a draft trade or something. Like, yeah, I was waiting for it. Nothing like. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I will say uh, the guy who kind of became the starter there for a while in New Jersey, uh, he saved my fantasy hockey season. Vicek Venacek. Uh, okay. v- Venacek. Um, yeah. He, yeah, dude. He, so I, I had, I don't remember who I had in goal, but I was like, oh my God, waiver wire pickup. Sure. Former Capitals backup. Okay. Let's see how he does in New Jersey. Best goalie I had all year. So uh, what do you think going forward is I know the goalies, the goalie spot seems like it's kind of up in the air a little bit for New Jersey. What's the plan this season? I think they start with VTech. Um, you know, Schmid was great in the playoffs when they threw him in a, a really, you know, down O2 going on the road to MSG, which to me, it's not the most intimidating building, but I've never played there as a player. So I'm just anti MSG and anti Rangers, but that's the, you know, he, he showed up in a tough spot and look the the previous season, they just needed a goalie to make a save, like make the routine save. This team was going to score like Hughes, he's your brat. Like even before they brought in Meyer, uh, they had Dougie Hamilton. They had uh, a couple other guys that were Tatar had a pretty good season. Um, you know, they can score. It was just the goalies they had weren't making saves, even the routine ones. This past season, they got that from VTech, like, in spades. Especially early on, they went, like, 13-0 and or something in November. Like, since that point, they were, like, top five in the league, and they never dipped. Even if they had, like, a five-game pointless streak or losing streak, they still never dipped out of the top five in, in points in the league. Um, and it was because he kept them in a lot of games – you know, yeah, he gave up three goals a couple of times. He gave up four goals a couple of times. The boys were scoring six, seven, eight goals. Like Dawson Mercer had a great year out of nowhere. Again, um, the defense was better. They brought in John Marino. They cleaned some things up. They got a little younger, bigger, faster, right? They kind of adapted to the way the new NHL is now. You don't have to. We've seen it a couple of times now. Like, it's great to have a number one goalie like, like uh, Vasilevsky. But that's not a prerequisite for winning the cup anymore. Like when we were growing up, right? You needed to have a Marty Brodeur or uh, uh, Eddie Belfour or one of these great goals, a Hasek, a Chris Osgood. Like these get Mark Andre Fleury. These were all like great top top of their team goalies or top of the league goalies. Not every goalie wins, you know. Not all the greats end up winning, but a lot of them did back then. Now it's like Vasilevsky and kind of everybody else to me. And we saw last year with Vegas, like they won with a guy that like how many teams have passed on Aiden Hill over the last couple of years? Like it's, and they, they put him in, they didn't even consider putting quick in the guy that had all the experience. Yeah. So I think with, with VTech in the playoffs, he kind of looked like a little bit of a deer in a headlight. Like I I've seen some, some shit. I've, I've been around enough to see a thing or two. Um, and we talked to him after the first two games and he, he looked like, everything was a little too fast for him. Um, Whether that carries over to next season, I don't think so. I think it's just kind of a a little bump in the road. He's still a younger kind of goalie. You mentioned he was with the Capitals, never really got a fair shot there. It kind of split with Samson off back and forth and 1A, 1B, 1B, 1A. Um, I think they'll end up doing the same thing this year. I don't know if Schmid is ready to play full-time in the NHL. and, And around here, it's like, you know, there's, there's a lot of the, the fans are like, oh, they can't put him in the minor leagues. Are you kidding me? Like, he, he won the Rangers series for us. He's still a, a young kid. He hasn't played, like, maybe – I don't think he's even played 50 games in the NHL. Like, there's still a lot of learning, especially for a goaltender. Like, and you know, you've watched hockey a lot. Like, the AHL is, is tough because 
you know, there's no, not a lot of structure. There's not a defensive structure. You try, but then injuries happen and call ups. And then you're playing guys be called up from the ECHL and, and some local dude is playing for you tonight. Like, so the goaltenders go through a lot where when you come up to the NHL, everything is so structured and, and compact and everybody knows the system and everybody's on the same page, especially the good teams. Um, so he was able to kind of settle in a little bit, but I still think he needs a little bit more seasoning. Um, I'm trying to think of who the other, I know they brought in a goaltender this summer, but I can't remember who it is. Um, but for my money, VTech is going to be the one. Um, and then it's kind of patched together the, the, the rest of, of the games, whether it's me, they have another kid and Nico Dawes who played a few games. Um, he played, I think it was during the COVID year or right after COVID. And he had some really nice performances and was really good in the minor leagues this past year. So um, that's kind of always going to be the Achilles heel right now. They don't have, you know, Marty Brodor is walking through that door, but he isn't, he isn't walking through with the pads on. He's, no. he's only walking through to like pump the boys up because he's the assistant general manager now. <laughs> right. Yep. Um, well, uh, Matt Harris, I'm, I'm going to give you comment of the show. Congratulations. You win nothing except my admiration. Uh, he says, what's it like having a defense asking for a friend How about a yeah, as a blues fan? Pass. What's that? How about a crisp high five? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll do one of those. Um, yeah, it's, uh, the defense here was a mess last year. So we'll but see if they can improve this year. We went through some tough years. Like I even go back and look two, three years ago and look at the defense core. And I'm like, whoa, like, man, we had, we had some names. We had a lot of retreads, um, a lot of, you know, you hope this guy works out. Uh, Will Butcher was, was a, a guy that they had kind of high hopes for, a Hobie Baker winner. And he kind of passed around by a, a bunch of teams. And um, the three years that they had him, like he had one good year and then just kind of fell off a cliff. And they had so many, so many cases like that where um, – it feels like now, like a lot of the draft picks, it, it, it helps. It helps when you get first overall twice in three, four years. Yep. Um, but they've done some some savvy scouting and some savvy signings. Um, the Toffoli trade I loved this summer. Uh, oh, I did too. I, that was a guy I always loved uh, watching play, especially uh, the Kings, Montreal. Um, those are some of the games I really remember him taking over. Um, so hopefully he can, you know, all he's got to do is just ride shotgun with these kids now and, just go to the front of the net and just just tappy tap, tappy tap. Yep. In Palat, same thing. Andre Palat, um, another great addition, and uh, Timo Meyer. Um, you know, you mentioned I, you know, shameless self promotion. I work at Pucks and Pitchfork, covering the Devils. Um, within the last say month and a half, I did an article that the Devils have the best top nine in the NHL. Um, it's hard all, to argue if they're all running on all cylinders and everybody's healthy. Um, I'm 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 comfortable putting their top nine against anybody else. The defense is another story, but again, you just got to outscore the other team now in the NHL. This isn't like when we grew up in two to one, three to two games, one nothing games. There's, there's a lot of six four games, and sometimes you're losing four one and you win six four. So, yep, um, it's, That's true. it's a different NHL, and and I feel like they're really on the cusp of last year was just kind of like the taste. Like okay, now we know we have to go through it all over again. But you just yep. got to make the playoffs. You don't got to win the division. You don't got to be first overall. Just make the playoffs, hopefully relatively healthy. And then it's a lot of it is matchups. You know, like you get the team, you match up right with the team. Like for the Devils fans, for years, they would get the Flyers in the playoffs. It was like, we could beat the Flyers. They couldn't beat the Rangers or they couldn't beat the Carolina Hurricanes. You give us the Flyers, easy money. Even Boston <laughs> Bruins back then, Pittsburgh. They always found a way to, you know, Pittsburgh got the best of them a couple of times, but they were able to beat them too. And the years that they won the cups, they didn't have to go through the Rangers, didn't have to go through um, any of the, the, the really big teams like Ottawa or Buffalo. They would always kind of get knocked off. And um, a lot of it is luck. A lot, you know, a lot of, oh, it yeah. is like, you know, right place, right time, right goalie. Yep. Um, uh, hope, hopefully for both of us, one day it would be cool to 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 meet in the finals. We'll see. Oh yeah, it, I I, I really hope that happens in our lifetimes. 
I, I don't know if I'll live that long. I'm a little older than you. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. With my lifestyle, maybe I don't make it past yeah, 40. We'll you have a kid. I don't have kids, so that's different. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we've got uh, – this was Dan Rice of the IceGarden.com and PucksandPitchforks.com. And, again, co-host of Around the Rink podcast. You can find everything he does over at the IceGarden.com for women's hockey, Pucks and Pitchforks, Pucks and Pitchforks. Dot com uh, for all of his uh, Devils coverage. And then again, of course, Around the Rink. It's part of the Ice Garden. If you look for the Ice Garden, wherever you get podcasts, you'll find his work. Or you can listen live on Twitter as well. Um, I think I covered everything, Dan. But thank you again for coming on. Again, longtime friend of the show. Actual friend of mine. Someone that uh, I'll just tell you, and I know I've said it on the show before, that time when we were at the NHL draft together, and then we went to the Phillies game that night. I I will remember that until I'm on my deathbed. Just an unbelievable fun time hanging out with you. We'll do it again eventually. The wife and I are talking about going to New York next summer. So if that happens, I will be definitely giving you a call. But um, always love having you on. Maybe we can work something out, have you on this season as well when the Blues and the Devils face off. But uh, again, thank you very much for coming on. And uh, looking forward to all the work you're going to be providing us this season. Yeah, thanks again, Jeff. Thanks to everybody that was listening, submitted questions in the comments. Uh, that was really awesome and cool to see. Like I said, I do kind of a live show too, and I really like that aspect. Uh, I appreciate you again um, reaching out to me to, to bring me on to have uh, these discussions. I can kind of let loose a little bit and not have to be so, um, you know, not that anybody couldn't find this if they just searched for it, but um, kind of let loose a little bit and... Um, you know, uh, you mentioned the, the draft in Philadelphia. That was awesome. Um, great memory for me as well, and, and something I always think of when I think of uh, think of Jeff Ponder. So um, it's been great to, to catch up with you, and hopefully we'll catch up during the season, bud. Always. I'm looking forward to it, buddy. All right. Well, that'll do it for today's show. Support for Let's Go Blues Radio is brought to you in part by ID Life. Uh, I lost my spot. The world's only truly personalized vitamin platform based on a health assessment of your DNA. Visit rockinthatidlife.com for more information. That's rockinthatidlife.com and get 10% off by emailing Dustin at rockinthatidlife at gmail.com and tell him Let's Go Blues Radio sent you. And by Mike Burgoyne from Real Brokerage Realty. Visit strikewithmike.com today for all of your home buying and selling needs. That's strikewithmike.com and by Center Ice Brewery, St. Louis's tasty hockey themed beer. Check out your local beer vendors for availability. That's Center Ice Brewery beer. Please drink responsibly. That will wrap up episode 17 of season 12 of the original St. Louis Blues Hockey Podcast. Let's go, Blues Radio. Thanks for listening. And thanks to those who participated in the YouTube and Facebook live chats during the show. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. For Dan Rice of the Ice Garden and his many other projects, as well as the absent Bill Day, Kirk Price, and producer Austin, I'm Jeff Ponder, and this was Let's Go Blues Radio. Until next time, everyone, let's go Whitecaps. <laughs> Sit, Ubu, sit. Good dog. <laughs> you thought I was going to say a son of a bitch, didn't you? <laughs>